Go ahead. Welcome everybody to our Zoom cooking class today. Nice to see you. We have a French bistro theme going on today with some classic recipes. Uh, and then I know I see some familiar faces. I always just like to uh, tell a little bit about myself um, before we get started. If um, this is the first time that you're taking uh, one of my cooking classes. So I've been teaching cooking classes now for well over 20 years. Baking and French cooking tend to be my specialties. Uh, my husband and I have now, we've taken four trips together um, over the years to France. We're always really inspired by the cuisine, of course the wine, and the culture. Oftentimes, Walt and I will team up to do cooking classes together where we do some food and wine pairing like we're doing today. So we're gonna be making a classic French lemon tart. Uh, and then we're also making a croque monsieur, uh, which you'll find in French cafes and bistros um, and brasseries. Uh, and Walt has picked out two different wines to pair with our croque. And for those of you that are cooking along, I'd like to kind of explain the timeline, the format of the class that I have in, in uh, mind. Uh, just be, depending on the timing of things, uh, it, it may be fluid a little bit, uh, but what we will be starting in on today is the tart recipe. And what we need to do first off is, um, and don't get started yet, I just want to give you a little overview, is we'll get the butter mixture into the oven that needs to get nice and hot and bubbly before we add the flour. So once we get that in the oven, I'm going to um, show you, we'll measure our flour together for the tart. I'm then going to hand things over to Walt, and he's actually going to introduce the sparkling wine. It's not too early in the morning to open up a little bubbly. Uh, so he'll be talking about our sparkling wine that we're pairing with the croak. Uh, by then, our uh, butter mixture should be nice and hot. We can add our flour. We will um, make our dough. We will fill our tart pan and then get our crust into the oven. And then that's the perfect opportunity to make our lemon curd. We'll make our lemon curd, we'll strain that, and I think the timing between when we're done with that, our pastry should be coming out of the oven. We can fill the tart shell. It needs to go back in the oven for about six minutes just to help the lemon curd set a little bit. And then after that, we can move into our recipe for the croque. We're making a classic French white sauce, a bachamel. We're adding some Gruyere cheese. Um, and then we will be assembling our sandwiches, slathering the tops with a little bachamel, a little more cheese, and getting those in the oven. Uh, if you've traveled to France before, or gone to a Paris cafe, it's pretty traditional. Um, you're, even an omelet or a sandwich or a piece of fish is oftentimes paired with um, some greens just tossed in a classic French vinaigrette. So I thought it'd be nice to have some greens on the side with our um, sandwich because it is, it's delicious, but it is very rich. And then when our sandwiches are in the oven, Walt's going to talk about our second wine selection and we can answer any questions and, and wrap up um, our class. So that's kind of the plan for the day. So let, let's jump in, let's get started. Um, go ahead and turn to the uh, tart recipe. I'll be walking you through everything. We asked you to mise en place, which is a French term to either assemble ahead of time or put into a place, all the ingredients with the exception of measuring the flour. So I have my butter here and I did cut it up into cubes, um, just thinking that it would um, go ahead and melt a little faster in the oven, you're gonna be adding three tablespoons of water to um, our butter, and you need an oven-proof bowl. And then we have some sugar, so you have a tablespoon of sugar, 
and then an eighth of a teaspoon of salt. And then we just have a tablespoon of vegetable oil. So you just want for this uh, recipe, a neutral um, oil. So I wouldn't recommend like using olive oil. Okay, so once you have all of these ingredients in your bowl, we're gonna go ahead and slide this into our preheated 400 degree oven. And we want this to be nice and hot and bubbly. You might even see a little bit of browning around the edges of the bowl after about 14, 15 minutes. So I'm gonna slip this into my preheated oven. And Lori, let's check this in about 14 minutes if you don't mind setting a timer for me. Okay. Okay, so you want this nice and hot and kind of bubbling and sputtering. And be sure, um, I don't wanna forget, remember when we are mixing in the flour, that bowl is really hot. So we're gonna use the same bowl um, to mix our flour. So just be careful, you wanna be mindful of that. I don't want people burning, burning their hands and I don't want to either. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and measure our flour. So I, I know, um, that Gordon and Eric have taken um, a lot of my classes since we've been doing the Zoom classes. This recipe is completely opposite of what I've taught you, right? Um, as far as the pastry that we make with the cream cheese and the butter where everything's cold. Um, and the way we measure the flour is a little different as well. If you have a scale, um, you want about 5.5 ounces of flour. In this recipe, it says a generous cup of flour. So if you don't have a scale, I wanna help you to be more precise in your measurement. So in our previous recipes, we've used a technique that's called spoon and sweep, where we're spooning the flour into the measuring cup and leveling it up. This is different. We're doing scoop and sweep. So I want you to take your measuring cup. I have my flour in a bowl if you have it um, in uh, the canister, that's okay. You might just give it a little stir just to aerate it. And I'm gonna just scoop a bunch of flour into my measuring cup. I am gonna level it off. And that's gonna be my one cup of flour. I'm going to actually weigh my bowl and we'll compare how we do. Should be about 5.5 ounces. Okay, so there's one cup and that got me to five ounces. So that's what I want. And then two more tablespoons is going to get us to 5.5. So one and two. So when we, this is actually, and I'll, I'll talk more about the cooking class um, a little later because uh, it's really fun um, to just recount some of the memories and, and share with you what the experience was like. But of course, um, the teacher that we had, she, she did this all by, you know, sight and touch. She would add, just add the flour and get it to just the right Point, the dough just to the right point. She could tell exactly um, how much flour she needed by sight and touch. But to then replicate this recipe, I think it's a little bit easier to have a more specific amount. So 5.5 ounces or one cup, two tablespoons using then the scoop and sweep method of measuring. So we're waiting for our butter mixture. We have our flour standing by. You're gonna want to have a heat proof spatula, a fork, and then I have a nine inch tart pan with a removable bottom. So go ahead and have your, your pan, your flour, and your spatula and a fork standing by for our next step. And then to just fill the time while we're waiting, for um, our butter to get all bubbly. Um, and Lori's gonna keep an eye on the timer for us. 
I thought I'd go ahead and have Walt introduce uh, the sparkling wine that uh, we selected. And two, just so you know, come on up. Uh, when we were selecting these wines, we met, um, you need to come check out um, our wine department and Sarah was there when we um, were picking uh, these wines out. So she's, everybody's very knowledgeable, um, but we were working with her and we've worked with her with uh, previous classes. And we all decided since this is kind of lunch, brunch, it would be fine, to, it'd be fun to do a sparkling wine. That's and right. There you go, Walt. All right, how's everybody doing on this beautiful Saturday? And uh, so what I want to do here is introduce you to a really, really nice, it's a Bruce, Brut Cremant. So it's, it's actually uh, Champagne in France, technically has to come from the Champagne region, but it doesn't mean that wine made in the Champagne or Cham Methods Champenois can't be done in other parts of France or elsewhere in the world. In France, they call it Cremant. So this has a little bit of, a little longer time on the skins. So you get this nice salmon color. So this is a, a Cremant Rosé. And uh, this is, it, it runs between 15 and, and $20 range. So the price point is really nice. If you look into something from the Champagne region, generally you're looking at 35 at the basement. And that goes up high, very you know up toward a hundred, you know well well above a hundred in some cases. So anyway, this is this is a really nice bargain. It's very tasty. It, it has a lot of berries and it has a nice little kind of a even like a little creamy note in the background, and it, it pairs really really well with a lot of different things. And, it, and it, you know, the one thing about rosé you mentioned is it's it's one of those wines that when you're trying to figure out one wine that pairs with a whole lot of different things, um, it, it's really a good choice. So now, um, does, does anybody know how many twists it takes when you take the, the wire cage off? Six. So six full turns. Now, uh, after, you know, when the Dodgers won the World Series this year, so at the end of that, they are probably shooting off those corks. And, uh, you know, just seeing how far they can, you know, as a projectile, uh, they can get those corks to fly. That's not what we want to do here. So the idea is to, when, when you do that, you have, you know, you're about maybe a, a fifth of the champagne or the cremant or whatever you might be pouring will foam out the top and, and you'll also lose some of that effervescence. So you don't get the full effect, although, although it's fun to do. So anyway, you know, if you, a good way to do it, you don't have to be brute strength here. Uh, you, you just grab the cork like so. If you're, you know, if you need a little bit more leverage, you can take a, you know, like a towel and wrap it, cradle the cork and get a good grip on it. And uh, if you want to work hard at it, you can turn the cork. But why not make it easier for yourself? You have a bigger surface down at the bottom of the bottle, hold the cork in place, turn the bottle and just gently let it out. And it should make a little type sound when you, when you release, there it goes. Right. So there it is. And uh, so you get this beautiful salmon color. What I'll do, I'll hold a, a white sheet here so you can, it's a little easier to see that. So, So on the nose, you have a little kind of a strawberry type of an essence. And it's, it's really, it's a nice balance. It's not, uh, it's not overly sweet. And uh, so. Are Gordon and Eric? I, yes, I love Gordon and Eric. Like They're that. tasting oh, with us. I Very think good. it's more fun. It is. And it is. You can, as Walt describes the wine, you can think about what he's saying. That's true. It helps to have that along, alongside. So the, uh, the varietals in this, you have Chardonnay. And now, now I should mention, this is made in, in an area of France that's, it's in the south of France, but it's kind of between the Rhone River, inland a little bit from the, uh, from the Mediterranean Sea, then between the border of Spain and France. And there's a, 
a city called Perpignan. When you go inland a little bit, you have Labu. And uh, so that's, you're kind of in the hill country. And Lamu, it's an ancient city. It has a big, you know, it's kind of like a castle wall fortification that goes around the town. So they're able to, in, in that area, although the Chardonnay doesn't really typically get grown in that area the way it does in, in areas like the, uh, specifically the, the Burgundy region or Burgogne area and then Champagne region, farther to the north. And then Chenin Blanc is in here too. And that comes from generally it's it's most heavily uh, grown and, and created into wines in the uh, Loire Valley. So that Loire is the longest river in, in France. So, and then also Pinot Noir. So you can have a little bit of that Pinot Noir skin that's left in there. And that's, that's where you get that rosé color anyway. So if you have it, take it, tilt it up, take a nice little loft. Mm. So it's nice little acid. Um, it's not, as again, you're not going to notice it being particularly sweet and that's good. So well, that having it said, there's a little bit of a creamy background. So you're, uh, you're able to pair this with, you know, the dessert such as creme brulee with a couple raspberries on top. And uh, the next wine, which will be a red wine, you won't be able to do that with that dessert without it being, more, you know, basically competitive. And, uh, you know, your, your taste will be, uh, it, it, they, they work against each other here and it works in harmony. So you have, you have some rich elements to the sandwich and this will cut through it really well. Acid is, is a, good, a good source for being able to cut through with a lot of different types of dishes. So anyway. Uh, great. Thank you, Paul. Well, yeah. That was a, a great description. Great. And it looks great. Delicious. Yeah. I think it, look, it looks really pretty with um, the sandwich too. It does. Yeah. So do you want me to pour a second one here? Yeah, just, just a tiny just, bit. Just I'm, for... I'll sip on it really okay. after class. All right. I have to keep my head clear. <laughs> yeah, it's early morning. Right. Exactly. All right. You want to take over? Yeah, I can take over. How okay. are we doing on our time, Lori? Yeah, so we have two minutes. Okay, so you can take that. And so I wanted to show um, a picture, hopefully, should I come up closer to the camera? Can you make that out? Um, you can kind of, what is it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so this is a picture when we were in our cooking class in France. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's perfect right there. This is the tart that we made. So we used the tart crust that we're um, using today for our lemon tart. But our teacher, her name's Paul Collette, um, had us make a pastry cream with ground almonds and some cream and eggs and almond extract. And then we um, purchased French plums. We were back there in September of 2009. And so we topped our tart with French plums and she's drizzling honey over the top. Uh, so that, that's what we made with the same tart crust uh, that we're using today for our lemon tart, but I wanted to share that uh, with all of you. And then that also leads me into talking a little bit about this uh, tart crust. Um, it works really well for recipes that ask for a pre-baked pastry shell and where the filling is going to have a little more body. So like pastry cream, our lemon curd. I've used this um, for a savory recipe before where we had uh, caramelized onions and olives and anchovies. That's called a pizza lavier. That sounds um, It does not work well with fillings that are thin or creamy. Um, I, I did try to use it to make quiche and it didn't go well because uh, you'll see after we bake this off, 
you get kind of fine cracks in the bottom of the pastry shell. And so with a quiche, because of the eggs and cream, uh, when I went to then bake the quiches in the oven using um, this uh, recipe, um, and I did pre-bake the, um, the crust, uh, because the tart pan has a removable bottom, uh, my crust, my, my filling started to leak out a little bit. Your and timer that, went off. That's in your oven. So this- uh, Jill? Yes. Your timer went off. Okay, let's check. So just note that uh, this, this is a, a great, fun little recipe that's fast, um, but it is only suitable for certain applications, okay? So let me take a look at how things are going over here. Okay, so this is perfect. Um, my butter mixture is bubbly. I have a little bit of brown around the perimeter of my bowl. Um, you want this to be nice and hot. Remember that bowl is hot, okay, you guys? So be careful. And I'm gonna go ahead and add my flour. And then I have a rubber spatula. And I'm gonna add the flour all at once. I'm gonna first give this just a little stir. And then as you're stirring, you wanna pull the flour into the middle of the, the mixture so that the liquid absorbs the flour. So I'm pouring this in all at once and then pulling the flour to the middle so it can be absorbed by the liquid. And I'm gonna use a towel to hold on to the bowl so that I can stir and get the flour mixed in. So this should come together into a ball and the dough should be pulling away from the sides is what you're looking for. And that liquid mixture really absorbs the flour in just less than a minute. Okay, so once you have your dough here, you're then gonna transfer it into your tart pan, okay? And then what I want you to do is take your spatula and start spreading it out. And this just helps you to start pressing it out, but it also helps to start cooling down the dough so that we can touch it with our fingers. And you're gonna be pressing this out. You can use your fingertips, the heel of your hand to um, get the base going. You want an even layer. And then you're gonna start working the dough up the sides of the tart pan, you can use your fingers. And then I'll also show you kind of a decorative way to push the dough up the sides using a fork. So this is where I can go ahead. It's cool enough for me to cut. You might have to wait just, just a minute, but it's not too bad at all. So I'm pressing this so that I have an even layer on the bottom and starting to work the sides up with my fingers. So just keep pressing on the bottom and then working, working up along the sides and I'm kind of rotating the pan to push the dough up the sides and just making sure too that I have an even layer along the bottom.
and you can sometimes it gets thick a little bit around the bottom edges so you can kind of ease the dough up the sides but then also make sure that it's not too thick around the edge and the side. Jill, I think what I'll do is when you're done, if you wanna bring that up to the camera and just show them yeah. a closer view. So I'm just kind of tapping the bottom with my hand, patting it out. So that's even. And then you can take the back of your fork and press to kind of work the dough up the sides. And it's decorative and it's okay if uh, on the sides, it comes up a little bit past the one inch side You'll get a little bit of shrinkage on this, but not very much. And just keep working your way around with the fork. Okay. I'm gonna pat that just a little more. I think that looks pretty good. The other thing you're gonna do, let me come and show you is, um, let me wipe off my hands. Is you need to prick the bottom of this pastry. It will, it does puff up a little bit when baking, but don't be alarmed. It will settle down, if that makes sense. That's perfect, Jill. Can okay. everybody see that? We have a close up. That's what you're going for. Okay. People are looking. Did everybody see that? Let's do it just another minute. Okay. That's beautiful, Jill. Okay, so now I'm gonna prick the bottom. And I'm just gonna go around. In your recipe, it says 10 to 12 times. It's okay if it's a little or I think it says 10 times. It's okay if it's a little more than that. Okay. I think that looks good. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this back in the oven. The nice thing about this recipe too, you notice, you can pre-bake this pie shell if you've ever um, pre-baked a pie shell. Oftentimes you have to use pie weights. You don't need any pie weights for this recipe either. Um, it seems like the sides shrink down just a little bit, but other than that, um, it pretty much stays uh, exactly how it looks now. You're gonna have this in the oven. We're gonna have Lori time again for about 14 minutes. We'll see where we are. Um, the edges should be um, starting to turn golden. You want a little color on the bottom, uh, but kind of keep an eye on it. The other day when I made um, a lemon tart just to practice, it took a little longer than 14. So we'll, go, we'll be judging by time, time and color. Okay, and so, this recipe, uh, actually our teacher, um, she has a cooking school, Promenade Gourmand um, in Paris. This was the second cooking class we took in Paris. And this recipe has been in her family for decades. And she got this recipe from her husband's uh, grandmother. So it's nice to share it um, with all of you. So at this point, I think we're ready to move on to our lemon curd. So let's go ahead and grab uh, the ingredients for that recipe. Oh, I have an egg in, well, I have an egg in the refrigerator. Can you grab that for me? Yeah, the back one. It's like two little bowls and an egg. 
And for this recipe, you need what's referred to as a non-reactive saucepan because we're using lemon juice. Thank you. Um, we have our lemon zest. Uh, you have zest from two lemons. I went ahead and had you cover it up so the zest uh, didn't dry out. We'll be stirring this in after we strain our lemon curd because I don't want to strain out any of the lemon zest. And when I zest a lemon, um, you'll, I think most people have microplanes. I always do it like this so that I can see that I'm getting the zest and not the white pith. And then the lemon zest is what has those nice aromatic oils that just add so much flavor. Um, we asked you to juice uh, some lemons. You need a cup of lemon juice. Uh, I need my knife. I'm using today Eureka lemons. I actually have a couple of Meyer lemons here too. So if you're using Eureka lemons, you're gonna need more sugar. So in your recipe, it called for three quarters of a cup of sugar if you're using the Eureka lemons, and then a half a cup of sugar if you're using Meyer lemons. So Meyer lemons, they're a combination of lemons and mandarins. So that's why they're a little sweeter. Um, Eureka lemons are kind of considered a true lemon because they're not a product of hybridization. Um, and so they're gonna be, uh, the Eureka lemons tend to be a little more tart and acidic. Um, both are gonna be delicious, whichever, uh, kind of lemon you're using for your tart. Uh, so you will need a little more sugar if you're using the Eureka. Uh, when you're looking for lemons, you want lemons that are heavy for their size. The skin should be firm. Um, if they're heavy for their size, you know you're gonna get a lot of juice from the lemon. Um, and they'll keep uh, in your refrigerator for weeks. And it seems like lemons are abundant uh, in the winter time. So this is a, a perfect uh, seasonal recipe uh, for this time of year. And a little bit more about lemons. They're high in vitamin C. Um, and two, here in California, we are the leading producer of lemons for the United States. About 92% of uh, the crop comes from uh, California. So you, um, I went ahead and did this earlier. I did strain my lemon juice because I still had, even though I was um, using this juicer, I still had some seeds and I went ahead and removed the pulp. So we have a cup of lemon juice and I'm gonna go ahead and add my sugar. So I have three quarters of a cup of sugar and then you have 12, tablespoons of butter. So a stick and a half of butter that I cubed um, just again so this will melt a little faster. And this is an interesting recipe. It actually has us add all of the ingredients together um, and then bring this lemon curd together um, on the stove top. So the sugar, the lemon juice, the butter, and our eggs. And I have four yolks and then I have four whole eggs. And I know we asked you to do this uh, ahead of time, but I just thought I'd show you um, just a technique that I use for separating eggs. Um, it's easier to crack open and separate eggs if your egg is cold. And it's also easier to break open an egg if you use a flat surface, you get what's referred to as, you get a cleaner break, and then you're less likely to get shell in your egg. And instead of using the shell, I use my hand, and you're, you're actually more efficient at separating the egg if you use your hand. Your hand's more gentle too, so you're less likely to, um, 
break the yolk. If this isn't um, necessary, but if you have some of your egg whites left from separating um, the eggs, remind me and when our tart shell comes out. Um, do we have pastry brushes, Lori? I think you have one right behind you. Okay. Uh, turn around. Yes. I'll show you a little trick to kind of moisture proof the bottom of our tart shell. It's not necessary, but if um, you have any of your egg whites left over, um, I'll show you that little technique. Don't let me uh, forget. And um, you can always use it for next time. Uh, okay. So let's go ahead and add our yolks and our whites to this mixture. And we'll go ahead and transfer our ingredients to the stove top. You want your heat, we're gonna work between medium and medium low. You don't want this, you want this mixture to thicken, but you don't want it to come to a boil because we are working with eggs here. Jill, um, yeah. with our range, it might be a little challenging. So I know. yeah, I our thought range, about that. Yeah. I'll do my best. Hopefully, I won't end up with uh, scrambled eggs, but we'll be uh, straining this, so that's good. Okay, and then have your bowl and your strainer ready, um, and a whisk. So we're gonna melt the butter. And then we're going to start using a whisk to continue to uh, work with uh, our lemon curd. I'm going to move this. Okay. So we're just stirring. You can start um, breaking the yolks a little bit with the rubber spatula and just keep stirring until the butter is completely melted. And then we'll switch over to our whisk. And it's pretty amazing how fast this lemon curd comes together, really just in a matter um, of a few minutes. It also depends on how long your ingredients have been sitting out. If they're not as cold, it'll come together a little faster. I think I'll adjust my heat just a little bit. There we go. Okay. So to share with you a little bit more about the cooking class, Walt and I took, we, we've been to France now four times and three out of the four times we've taken cooking classes. And I think it's just such a great way to learn about the culture, get some new recipes. Um, oftentimes the classes are structured and this is how Paul's class was. You meet in the morning, they um, take you, the teacher takes you to the marketplace. Um, you do all the shopping for your class and then you go back. Um, we went back to her apartment in Paris and she has the recipes and you work together to create a really nice meal. And it's an opportunity to, to meet other people. You're not only getting to know the teacher and a little bit more about the culture, but you're really meeting people oftentimes from all over the world, which is really fun. Um, so with Paul, um, I can't remember everything that we had uh, in her class. We made, I would say, you know, it was like about a four course lunch and then uh, sat around her dining room table, enjoyed our meal. Her husband came out and talked about the wines that we paired with our lunch. That kind of gave me the idea of kind of weaving Walt into some of my cooking classes because he has a background in wine. He worked in the Carmel area before we were married with uh, the restaurants and wine shops. Uh, he worked for Young's Market Company. 
so it's just a great experience. And then that particular class, um, Paul then afterwards took us to a spice shop that was nearby and we toured the spice shop. Uh, so really, uh, you know, a memory that will last forever and many, money well spent and time well spent. So I highly recommend once we can travel again, right? Um, one of our teachers from Nice, uh, she's starting to do uh, Zoom cooking classes. Um, I haven't taken one from her, but they're kind of jumping, I think, on the Zoom bandwagon as well. So my butter is melted, and I'm going to switch over to my whisk now. And you want to whisk this constantly. I think I'm at a pretty good heat until this thickens. And I'll show you once this starts thickening what we're looking for. And again, I'm not looking for this. I don't want it to come up to a boil, but I do want it to be nice and thick. And you might have a few um, little bits of egg but that's okay. I mean, once we strain it, this will strain it out. And just keep whisking. So this recipe, I think if you wanted to experiment, you could use other kinds of citrus as well, or a combination. You know, if you wanted to you do a lime curd, or maybe if you wanted the mandarin, or not the mandarin, but the Meyer lemons, and maybe a little grapefruit could be nice. So it's one of those recipes that um, you can kind of make it your own. I can feel this is just, just starting to thicken. So oftentimes in France, your lemon tart's just going to be served on natural. If you wanted to serve this with a dollop of whipped cream, you certainly could. Um, Walt had this the other day with uh, some blueberries that were from California. Um, and the contrast looks really pretty with uh, the blueberries. You could sprinkle a little powdered sugar over the top. Jill? Yeah. Your timer went off. Oh, okay. Okay, well, can you come and just whisk for me? And just keep, don't be shy. My show is just a little blonde, Lori. So will you do two more minutes for me? Got it. Thank you. Getting there. I'll show you the consistency here in just a second.
And I can feel this is starting to tighten up. I'm almost there. Looking good. So it's starting, you want it so it's starting to coat the whisk. Almost like a pudding? Yeah, almost like a pudding. Timer went off. Okay, all right. I think we're good here too. Perfect, okay. All right. How's our little thing doing? She hasn't called 15 minutes, but it's got to be. Oh, she's like. How's it look, Jill? Looks good. I, this is the baker in me. This is what you have to do when it comes to baking. I want to do one more minute, okay? Okay. And remember when your tart shell comes out, we want to um, turn that temperature down to 350. Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and strain my curd to see how the consistency I have. So it's clinging to the spatula. It's really pretty thick. And then you're going to work it through a fine mesh strainer. And it smells really good. Now, is there any harm if somebody doesn't have a strainer and they aren't able to do that? I, for this, a lot of times you don't have to strain. But because we mixed all the ingredients on the stove top with the eggs, you're definitely going to have little bits of egg. Okay. And, and your timer went off. Okay. So the answer is you really do need to strain this. And I'm going to go ahead and turn this down to 350. All right, looking good. Woo. All right. So here's my crust. The bottom puffed up a little bit, but it'll sink back down. And I have some color around the edges. But you notice it didn't really shrink that much. I'm curious, how did everybody else do? Is everybody's um, crust pulled out of the oven? Yeah, okay, Jeff, thumbs up. I think Gordon's good. So what do we do, 14, 15, 16? I think that took about 17 minutes. Yeah, okay. And it, it takes just a couple minutes to kind of work the lemon curd through. I'll show you, Lori, the little bits of egg white I have Yeah, here. okay. And then if anybody has any questions, please feel free to uh, ask us. Oh my God, this looks so good. <laughs> and if you probably won't filling this tart, it seems like the amount of lemon curd is just right. But if you just wanted to make this for something else, um, you know, this is delicious, especially as, you know, the spring and the summer as more berries come into season. Kim, did you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, if my dough did not come together in a ball, what does that mean? I mean, I was still able to do the crust, but does that mean too much flour or? I think if it didn't come together into a ball, hmm. It seems like it might have been too much flour. Too much? Yeah, I think so too. Okay. And I think that's why Jill was talking about um, if you're able to weigh your flour for this particular recipe, um, right. weight, yeah, it's, it's really, you probably had more than 5.5 .5 ounces. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
And it still came out. Did you say that? It still turned out? It did, yeah. Good. It's nowhere near as beautiful as yours, but, <laughs> but it turned out. Okay. And also too, hopefully everybody's having success with their curd thickening. Um, and if, if you have any questions regarding your curd, please let us know. You can actually um, too fold in some whipped cream with this lemon curd and serve it with fruit it would be delicious. It would be good with scones too. Just would be good eating it by spoonfuls. But that's pretty good. Let's see. We measured out our ingredients. I think we were, we had, we started the tart press maybe about 10 after 11, but you've made a lemon tart in less than an hour. <laughs> that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay, and everybody, did you remember to um, turn your oven down to 350? Okay, I think I'm good. I can, can you see that, that I have some white? I may have to come up to the camera. Oh yeah. A little bit of egg white that's mm -hmm. cooked. That's why you want to strain this. Okay. okay. The close up is great. Thank you. Yeah. And what I like about this lemon curd, um, you'll find it's well too with all that butter in it. It just has a really nice silky uh, consistency and it sets up really well. Okay, so I'm just going to feel my tart shell. I think what we'll do is I just want that tart shell to cool for a couple of more minutes before we fill it and then put our um, tart back in the oven for about six minutes. So I think what I can do is maybe just talk a little bit about the vinaigrette. Uh, and then uh, we'll be ready to put this in the oven and start working on our bachamel. This is also an opportunity. You might not have two saucepans. If you need to wash the pan that you're, you made the lemon curd in, that you may also be using that for your bachamel. This is an opportunity to do that too. I almost forgot you guys. Oh, wait, 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 before, I take it back. I'm not going to move on to vinaigrette. I have two more things I can tell you. One, don't forget, like I just did, stir in that wonderful lemon zest. And then I want to show you the trick about moisture proofing. And I'll talk a little bit about egg whites. So I showed you, I demonstrated how to separate an egg. And I have a little bit of egg white here. While your, your tart, your crust is still hot, don't take too much, but just a little bit of egg white on the bottom of the crust and paint it on. That egg white will cook into the top of the crust and it'll help to moisture proof the bottom so that over time, the bottom will still stay crisp, even though you have a custard-like filling, filling your tart. So that's a little tip. It's not in your recipe. I thought about it later um, that you can do. And then two, with your egg whites, um, you may already know this, but they freeze really well. You can freeze them in um, a Ziploc or a little plastic container. They can freeze like up to six months, uh, have them thawed in your refrigerator, then set them out so that they get warm to room temperature. You could use them for a meringue or an angel food K, or a lot of times if you're making soufflés, it'll call for like 
um, four egg yolks and seven egg whites. So you'll, you'll be ahead of the game. You'll have extra egg whites already to make a souffle. Um, so I wanted to share that you can freeze uh, your egg whites. So I'm gonna go ahead and since I ate up a little more time, fill my tart shell. That looks beautiful. And then you can smooth it out with the spatula or a small offset spatula, which I brought. I don't know where it is. Is it in the um, a closet? No, I brought, I don't think so. I thought, oh, here it is, it's over here. Because I also need to use it for the another recipe. So you can just smooth that out. And also, um, I just want to check with everybody. If we are going too quickly for you, does anybody need us to slow down at all? Or are you where Jill's at? OK, Gordon's good. Okay. Becky's good. OK, I'm going to go grab, I'm going to put this on a baking sheet since I now have this filled um, before I put it back in the oven. So I'm going to go grab that. That looks good. I'll be right back. Yay. Okay, so there we are, into the oven. And Lori, you want to set the timer 350 degrees. Can you set the timer now for six minutes? And we'll just bake that um, till it's set. Julia just said the lemon curd is so good. All right, Julia, yay. And you said right. six minutes? Yeah, six minutes. I'm gonna just take a little drink of water here. Mm -hmm. Yay, I'm glad I was successful and everybody else. Good, good job. Okay, so let's go ahead and transition to the kraut recipe. And you should have all your ingredients, mise en place. Okay, are we ready? Are people ready to start on the bachamel? Kim? Just a, a quick question before you start. Um, yeah. I was going to serve this later today. Make the bachamel ahead of time. Will it be okay? Yes, and you know what? I'll give you a couple of options. Um, you can just heat it up slowly, but uh, one thing that Walt and I did, because uh, I always like to, some of these recipes I haven't made in a while that we've been making lately, I like to just refresh my memory. So I made four sandwiches. I baked them with the bachamel. We ate two for dinner. And then I just uh, went ahead and put them in a container with a lid in the refrigerator. And the next morning, I just warmed them up. I put them in a Pyrex dish with a little foil over the top and warmed them up in an oven at about 300 degrees for maybe, I don't know, about 10, 15 minutes. And I took the foil off just so the top could get a little bubbly again. And they warmed up beautifully, mm -hmm. even though I had cooked them all the way through with the bachamel on top. And I then serve them with um, an egg on top, which is a croque madame. So you can do it either way. You can assemble them, you can make your bachamel, just because you have cheese in your bachamel, warm up the sauce slowly is the tip. And then you can bake them, but you can also, if you have a couple left over, save them for the next, next day and they warm up beautifully. Thank you. Uh huh. Okay, so in this recipe, a lot of you probably have microwaves. 
Um, I don't have one handy. So I have a cup and a half of whole milk and I'm warming this up on the stove. You want the milk moderately hot. What you're going for here is that your roux and your milk are about the same temperature and that just helps to prevent uh, any lumps. And I'm gonna grab a whisk. So a bachamel is just a classic French white sauce. Butter flour is your roux. You add your milk, and in this case, uh, we're going to make a cheese sauce, so uh, we're also adding cheese. And for the sauce, I'm going to start on about medium heat. You have one and a half tablespoons of butter, and you have two and a half tablespoons of flour, a cup and a half of milk. So this is going to make a bachamel that is kind of medium body. Um, it's a little thicker um, so that we can more easily spread it on top of our sandwiches. And then we have three quarters of a cup of um, Gruyere cheese. So as the butter's melting, you want the butter to melt um, before adding the flour. Once the butter's melted, You'll sprinkle the flour over the top and whisk. And we're going to whisk for about one to two minutes. What we're doing here is we're just giving this a chance to cook out the raw flour taste of the flour. So we're not really going for color. We want more of what's referred to as a blonde roux. But cook this long enough so that um, the raw flour taste has a chance to um, cook out. Okay. And then if you're heating your milk about a minute, minute 30 um, in the microwave, you don't want this to come up to uh, a boil. And then the cheese we're adding is a Gruyere cheese. It's a cave aged Gruyere. Um, it's a cow's milk cheese that comes from Switzerland and it's actually aged in sandstone caves. So it has like a nice complex flavor. Um, it might be a little more expensive, but it's well worth it because a little bit does go a long ways. Uh, it has a complex flavor that can be kind of described as fruity, nutty, earthy, mushroomy, and also creamy in texture. Lori's kind of our cheese expert. Do you have anything else you would want to say about that cheese, Lori? I mean, you explained it perfectly. Um, you know, a lot of that flavor comes from the cows um, eating uh, flowers and the, the grasses. Um, up in the hills. So that really is what adds to uh, that flavor. Um, and your uh, timer went off. Oh, thank you. I'm going to just take, take my roux off. And for the sandwiches, I'm thinking a lot of you only have one oven. When you take your tart out, um, you want to turn your uh, oven back up to 400, okay? All right, oh yeah. And you can see my tart's nice and set. So if I give it kind of the jiggle test, you can tell that it's set up nicely. And I'm just gonna let that cool. You probably wanna let that cool for a couple of hours. The other night when I made this, I let it cool at room temperature for two hours and then I just put it in the fridge for um, a half an hour and it sliced beautifully and tasted wonderful. Okay. All right, I'm ready to add my milk to my roux. Let me get that heated up. I'm gonna grab, that had lemon juice in it. I'm gonna grab my liquid measuring cup just because it's easier for me to pour this back into my pan. 
You're gonna start with a little bit. So you're pouring this in slowly. Pour some in. Go ahead and stir. And by doing that, it helps you so that you're not gonna get as many lumps. And stir in a little more. Get this smooth. I'm ready to add a little more. Try not to make too much of a mess, Lori. <laughs> okay. That other pan, if you, since the pilot is, is pretty high, if you want to just move that off of the stove altogether. Okay, I'm going to add the remainder of my milk. I'm going to come over here. Sometimes it's just a little bit easier to stir on a flat surface. And then we want this to come up to a boil. And by doing so, that's going to activate the uh, flour so that your sauce thickens even more. And you want to make sure this is a nice pan. It's not straight sided. It's a little easier to get into the corners to make sure that I don't have any lumps of flour, but kind of get into the edges of the pan with your whisk to make sure that you've incorporated all the flour. And then I'm going to take it back to the stove top. I'm going to turn my heat up just a little more so this has a chance to come up to a boil. It should just take a minute. Is everybody doing okay out there? There we go. So it's just come up to, starting to come up to a boil. You'll let this boil for about a minute. There it is. Now it's going. Hey, well, can you do me a favor? Can you grab the pot holders? I don't think that tray's too hot. But would you move that baking sheet over? Come back over here. The uh, pot holders are right in front of me. Would you just move this over so that it's not sitting sitting on the pilot? Okay. All right. I'm looking good on my Bachamel. Thanks. Just on the counter is fine. So now I'm going to add salt, pepper, freshly grated nutmeg, and three quarters cup of our Gruyere cheese. And I measured out the salt. The pepper in your recipe calls for half a teaspoon. For me, that's a little much. So I'm going to probably put in like about a quarter of a cup. So we'll sprinkle you mean a quarter that. of a teaspoon. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, a quarter of a teaspoon. Walt, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Um, I have a rubber spatula over here, one of the bigger ones. Can you just rinse it off for me? Kim, and, did you have a question? I'm and just dry, dry it off. Slow down just a little bit. My bechamel just started to boil. Okay, so about a minute and then take it off the heat. So you want to um, give it a chance to uh, activate the flour and thicken. 
And then I'm going to use some freshly grated nutmeg. And I'm just going to grate with a microplane grater. And there's nothing like freshly grated nutmeg. If you buy your spices whole, they're going to last longer. And the flavor of freshly ground nutmeg is superior to that that's commercially ground. And it's actually a seed from a tropical evergreen tree. It was one of the spices, here's your history lesson, that Christopher Columbus was in search for when he left Spain to uh, go to the uh, East Indies. Peppercorns and nutmeg. I'm going to add my three quarters cup of Gruyere cheese. And we'll stir that in. If it doesn't melt completely, you can transfer this over to the stove over low heat just to smooth it out. We'll see, see how it goes here. Seems like it's melting just fine. So you just want a smooth, smooth consistency. And then we'll reserve this while we assemble our sandwiches. Okay. That looks good. So I'm just going to put this over here. And then you're going to need the remainder of your cheese. I have Dijon mustard. I have my herbs de Provence. I have my cornichons. And we asked you. We asked you to, uh, I hope, shoot. I hope this is okay, Lori. You know what I did is I made the mistake of um, letting this sit on the stove top. Wow. So my bread is like really toasty. Mm. Yeah, those pilot lights are awful. I know. Well, it, it, they'll still see you. Okay. I'm, gosh, I'm tempted to, some of them are kind of falling apart. Oh, wow. Do you want to use that other bread? Yeah, I have some left of the other. Why don't, why don't you use that? I know. Okay. Well, at least we did really well on the tart. That was the one I was a little worried about. Okay. So it's just bread. So give me a chance. I'm going to slice a little more bread. This will give everybody a chance to catch up. Um, so if you guys are still on your bechamel sauce, um, you've got a little time. So I don't, I'm not gonna toast this bread so, uh, for this recipe. You would want to just lightly toast the bread um, before assembling, which I did. Here I have two little, two little ones here for about 10 minutes, so just lightly toasted. And you're cutting the bread about a third of an inch thick. Was everybody able to find the, the right bread? Yeah? You okay. just want a rustic bread and a bread that um, will hold up to the, the bachamel. And traditionally, this recipe always uses a white bread. I think that's going to turn out really nice, Jill. It's going to yeah, be okay. Yeah, I think it'll be okay. Yeah. All right. That piece is just a little off. Um, can sourdough be used? So it depends what you like. Um, this, the Levant, I was reading, uses a wild yeast similar to sourdough. It's considered a, like a French sourdough. But 
it's not as strongly flavored as like a San Francisco sourdough. So yes, the answer is yes, but it's kind of um, based upon your preference. Uh, Walt's my guinea pig. I think how he would critique it if I use sourdough, that maybe that would dominate some of the other flavors. So what you're going for is, is a balance of flavors, but it's certainly, it's up to you what you like. Gordon has a question and okay. it was, um, can egg white be spread on the toasted bread while still warm? Or on the tart crust? We were putting the egg whites on the tart crust. No, you don't want to put egg white on your bread. <laughs> okay. Have you guys had too much wine? <laughs> okay, well, can you get the ham out of the refrigerator for me? So we're going to go ahead and spread some Dijon. <laughs> he said, Gordon says, not enough, exclamation. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to spread some Dijon on four pieces of bread. So you're gonna have little sandwiches. So Dijon on one slice of your sandwich. Thank you. If you like a lot of Dijon, you could, you certainly could do it on both sides. So it's up to you. So I like Dijon, it just has a nice clean, sharp flavor. So while I'm assembling and spreading the mustard, I'll talk a little bit about the history of this sandwich. Um, and probably there's different ideas about how this originated, but this one kind of made the most sense. So it's thought back in about 1901 that there was a chef at a brasserie and he panicked because he ran out of baguettes for the sandwich of the day. So he had to scramble and come up with something else. So he just took a loaf of like country white bread, sliced it, put ham and cheese in between, and then toasted it in the oven. So if you take the word croak, croak is actually derived from the French verb croaker, which means to bite. So that kind of refers to the toastiness of the sandwich. So let's start working on our ham and I'll continue to talk about the history to finish the story. We're gonna drape two pieces of ham on each slice of bread that has the mustard. And I'm using a Mary's Black Forest ham. You probably have heard of Mary's before um, in reference to chicken, but I think they're now raising pigs, it seems like. So we, we're now carrying Mary's um, Black Forest ham, which is uh, delicious. So on each sandwich, you're gonna kind of drape or fold the ham two slices each or about an ounce per sandwich on each slice with the mustard. So how the story continues is that one of the customers was eating his toasty ham and cheese sandwich and he asked the chef about the origin of the ham, where it came from. And the chef pointed to a gentleman in the restaurant and said, it came from that guy. Well, that guy, that gentleman was the local butcher. So the ham came from the gentleman, the local butcher. So then you have monsieur, which means mister in French. So croak, monsieur is how the sandwich got its name. And so it's been on cafe and um, bistro menus since um, the early uh, 1900s. All right, so I'm down with my ham. So now I'm gonna take probably about two tablespoons of cheese per sandwich. 
and just kind of press it on top of the ham. And you're gonna save a little bit for the top too. And just kind of spread that out so it melts nicely. So about a tablespoon per sandwich for the top. So you wanna reserve about a quarter of a cup to finish these off. Like so. more. Okay. And I'm using a lined baking sheet because uh, the bechamel might dribble down just a little bit. It makes it easier then to um, use a spatula to pick it up and serve it. So now we're ready to then top our sandwich with the bread. You're going to press down. like so, kind of stagger these a little bit. All right, so pressing down, and now I'm gonna take my bechamel. You wanna give that a little stir. And it might be easier if um, you have a a larger spoon. We'll do this. So about, a, it's pretty thick, the sauce, about say a third of a cup of sauce on top of each sandwich. And you're just kind of slathering this sauce over the top. If you have a little bit left, you could always reheat it when you're about ready to serve and do a little smear on the bottom of the plate is kind of nice too. But we'll be pretty generous here. And I'll go back and add a little more to each one. And it's okay if some dribbles down a little too. Looks good. So I'm gonna add a little more to the top. And then I think I'll have just a little bit where I can warm this and put a little bit on the bottom of the plate. Yeah. yeah, Jill, I'm definitely splitting one of those at the end of class with you. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's good. So I'd say I have about a quarter of a cup of sauce left that um, I think I'll use for serving. And then to finish it off, you have herbs to Provence. So these are herbs that we would commonly associate with the south of France. Um, Lori, I, you can help me too, because I know you used to have your own little blend that you would make. Um, that we sold here at the co-op, but mm -hmm. like, of course, lavender, rosemary, thyme, marjoram, sometimes a little bay leaves. Yeah, I'm, maybe even some orange. Nice, yeah. Some orange zest. So a little bit goes a long ways. It's probably like about, I don't know, a quarter, maybe an eighth of a teaspoon on each sandwich. Beautiful. All right, lovely. And we'll reserve our cornichons for when we're serving. And I'm gonna put my bechamel over here. I'll warm that up in a few minutes. This will go in the oven 
for about 15 to 18 minutes. You want this to start to have kind of a golden color um, and be nice and melty. Uh, we'll see how our time goes. Um, we, uh, they may still be in the oven when we uh, finish up, but we'll see. So I'm gonna go ahead and put these in the oven at 400 uh, degrees. Can you, Walt, get that piece of lemon tart out of the refrigerator for me? So now we have our salad greens. So let's go ahead and talk about that. And then I'll let Walt talk about the um, very last uh, wine. Thank you. Thank you. So I gave you kind of a classic recipe, thank you, for um, a vinaigrette and asked you to go ahead and measure out the um, ingredients um, and make the vinaigrette. I didn't, I didn't finish making my vinaigrette, so I thought I'd just do it uh, in class. I'll help you clean up for it. <laughs> okay. I know. I was like, man, a lot of I dishes. Know, I know, I know. <laughs> okay, so we're using um, a really nice vinegar, a Zinfandel vinegar, late harvest. Tax is a wonderful vinegar if you haven't um, tasted it before. And in your recipe, I'm using two tablespoons of vinegar, six tablespoons of oil. I like a three to one ratio. And I chop the shallots and put it into the vinegar, which um, then kind of helps to soften the flavor of the uh, shallots. And shallots have a milder flavor anyway um, than onions. And they're used, they are a member of the onion family, but they're used quite a bit in um, French cooking. And then we have a little bit of Dijon mustard. That's going to act as a binder to help make an emulsification. We have a little bit of salt. We can um, season at the end. We can add a little bit of pepper. I'm going to go ahead and whisk this. And then you're slowly going to add your olive oil to this mixture to make the multiplication. Now at home, a lot of times now, and I get great results, I just use a mason jar uh, to make my dressings and just shake it all together um, when I make dressings. That's exactly what we do at home yeah. too. Yeah, it's just a lot easier. Less of a mess. Yeah. And then, and then it's great because you have it already in the container, and so you can just use what yeah. you need and then just set the rest aside. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great idea. And it's so easy to make your own dressings. It's actually it ends up being cheaper, I think, in the long run. Well, and the ingredients are far superior. You know. Uh, absolutely. And two, I like to use nicer olive oils for my dressings. Um, so I'll use the more expensive olive oils for, you know, like a dressing or if I'm making a mayonnaise or a pesto and I still cook with olive oil, but I'll use a less expensive olive oil to cook with. And I don't think everybody agrees, but I think the idea is that the heat, if you're cooking with an oil, the olive oil, it, it kind of breaks down uh, the flavor. And then Lori just got um, one of the five ounce containers of spring mix for me. So it's already pre-washed, so it makes it really convenient just to um, toss the greens lightly with your dressing and then serve it on the side uh, with uh, your croaks. Yeah, and Jill, I also wanted to talk about the health benefits of olive oil is um, it's just an amazing, it's amazing for your body. So um, I try to use olive oil as, as much as possible in yeah. my cooking. Thank you for that. So there you go, that looks beautiful. I'm gonna add a little bit of pepper and we'll just take a taste. Let's see how we are. Mm. 
Beautiful. Oh, that vinegar is so mm -hmm. good, Lori. Thank you. Yeah, that vinegar, uh, it's, it's the only vinegars that we use in our household. So if you guys shop at the co-op, I would highly recommend picking up uh, the cat's uh, uh, white wine vinegar, and they also have the red wine vinegar that she used. And that's nice because it's a late harvest. It has a lot, a little sweetness to it. So it really helps to balance out your vinaigrette. And I wanted to just show you a piece of the tart cut. And I have some fresh blueberries here on the side. Can you, do you need me to come up to the camera? Yeah, yeah if you can come to the camera. But you can see that um, the... Uh, Oh, Let that's so pretty. That really nicely. That's a nice little recipe for sure. There you go. Beautiful. Oh. On natural lemon tart. Okay, I guess we're now at that part of the show here for Walt to talk about our remaining wine and then I'll come back. We can answer any questions you might have. We'll check on our sandwiches. I'll clean up a little, Lori. Oh, that'd be great if you want to throw stuff in the sink. Okay, so there's a, a kind of a concept of trying a, a little lighter wine and then a, a red wine. And so we're on the red section now. And this kind of sandwich, and I think, you know, I, I know my mom sometimes when I was a little kid, I, I seem to recall that she sometimes cooked dishes that were a little on the bland side. And... Uh, I learned to appreciate that um, little seasoning can really kind of ramp things up a little bit. And I can assure you that the sandwich, there's nothing bland about it. It's, it's wonderful. It's really, it really, uh, it's, it's actually kind of, you can eat a sandwich with one croque monsieur and, and you, you will definitely feel like you've had lunch. So it, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful dish. And uh, so to have a red wine that stands up with it and not one that dominates it. So, you know, for example, if I were, you know, going to the backyard, have a Traeger that, that I've been using lately for smoking ribs for about five, six hours or so, and, you know, where that might call for a Zinfandel, you know, big, bigger, jammier Zinfandel to handle some of the smokiness of it. Uh, here, this is a, a lighter red. So how many people are familiar with Malbec? Okay, so... Malbecs generally come from Argentina, but the Malbec grape is, it originates in France, but it's, it's kind of understated and, and not, well, not as well known because generally it's not the, the lead grape in, in the blending of wine. So generally you find Malbec as a, an adjunct varietal, you know, in, in the uh, Bordeaux area where the wine, the red wines from the Bordeaux area are dominated by Cabernet and, and Merlot, but you also have Petit Verdot, Malbec, and uh, there's one other I forget, oh well. Um, <laughs> so Cahors is a, a little town that's about, it, I would say, you know, a good 100 miles or so to the, to the east of the Atlantic Ocean. So, so where we have Bordeaux, you follow the Gironde River. There's a river that's it's a long river that's considered a tributary river and it's serpentines to where it has ox bows that are, or uh, you know, bends in it where you can have half a mile between the, the, one part of the river and the next part of the river. And then it goes another seven or eight miles in the other direction where it bends around. So Cahors is spelled C-A-H-O-R-S, pr pronounced Cahors. And, uh, I think there's seven or eight bridges that cross the river and uh, very cute little town, although it's kind of out of, off the range of tourist locations. It's kind of place where if you go there, you probably need to know how to speak French, a, a little, have, have at least a decent uh, ability with that because you might not find the number of people that speak English quite as much as more, more tourist areas. So this is a, a wine that's made mainly with Malbec grape. And uh, so California wines, I think a lot of people are used to reds that, that have a lot of fruit. And, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty common. We have a hotter climate. This is, this is a little north of us. So 
I mean, the latitude in France is, is a little bit to the north. And uh, there, there is one particular characteristic that might make a difference in terms of how you consume this and when you consume this. It's 12.5% alcohol. So that makes it much lighter. You, you will not have such a hangover as you do when you, you have wines that are 14 and a half for economy. Cabernets coming from Napa and Sonoma, they're, they're commonly run about 14.5% alcohol. And so being used to California fruit, a lot of, a lot of people in the area we sometimes get together and have dinner with, they will uh, you know, taste a wine like this one. And you have to kind of, I like to lead people into understanding that do not have the expectations that it would be on you know, the same sort of flavor profile. That it does have fruit. It definitely has a good prominent fruit. So it's actually a fairly dark fruit. I mean, you can, it's dark enough that I can hold my finger behind the glass and I won't really be able to see my finger. So Syrah is famous for that, where a, a lighter red, like a Pinot Noir, you will, uh, if you look closely, you'll be able to see your finger. So when you, when you put it up to your nose, you pick up a little bit on uh, kind of like black tea, maybe, and, and don't, don't be offended by this. This is actually uh, kind of a complimentary thing, but a Ticonderoga, um, it, it, Dixon Ticonderoga number two. So that's like, what you're smelling is a little bit of cedar. That, that basically is a pencil, so it's like pencil shavings. So that's kind of in the back note. Now it's, it's a, you, you'll notice plum and blackberry, nice silky tannins. So it, it, it's really, this is an ideal wine with a stronger cheese. So, I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, a nice light type of a cheese like, uh, I don't know, Garlsberg, that would probably, this would be you know, definitely over the top. But Gruyere, you know, it has a bite to it, it has body to it, and you can go even stronger in the cheese department with that. So it really, it stands up really nicely to all the, you know, the robust flavors in, in the sandwich. And, uh, but at the same time, it doesn't dominate it with fruit or smokiness. So if you, for example, if you were to have a big Syrah, one of those really big bodied Syrahs, like you have in uh, California, some of the Syrahs are, and again, they're, they're more fruity in California typically, and Australia too. And, and in Australia, you might even pick up on, on a certain number of occasions, some little notes of eucalyptus because a lot of the vineyards are near eucalyptus groves, like the native tree there. And even though you might assume they're native here in California, they're everywhere. But this is really a nice wine. I, I have to, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that everybody would, would have a sip of this and think, okay, at a cocktail party with a little few bits of finger food, it's, you might want a little bit bigger, more, more California style. Uh, there's a minerality to this too, which is something that you don't normally pick up on California wines. There are a few that you can, like, like Shalom and Monterey County, you, you do pick up on a little bit of minerality, but generally that's an old world sort of a flavor characteristic. So it's not, you know, you're, you're looking at between 15 and $20 a bottle. Typically in that price range, you're not going to have a wine with a really long finish. So, and, and again, with the alcohol being 12.5, it's, uh, it goes down pretty easily, but it is sturdy. So it's not like one of those wines that you kind of find yourself drinking as if it were Kool-Aid on a hot day. So you can get in trouble with that because you, you keep drinking more and more of it and pretty soon you, you stand up and it's like, whoa, I've got a book. That's a rhetorical question. <laughs> but anyway, this is, this is a really, a, I mean, I think it's a great wine for the money. It's readily approachable. You know, there some of those really fine Bordeaux's, you know, there, there are wines that go anywhere from, $75. I mean, they're, they're an expensive Bordeaux out there too, but it's a little bit of a, it's about, a, it's, it's a bit of a crapshoot finding one that's really, really good. They're out there, but you have to do your homework. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really good ones, especially those that are on the Cabernet driven side, those are meant for aging. 
Now, yeah. this wine, you can age, but probably about two years. It's really, it's, this is best to just open it and drink it. Yeah, I love this type of wine, Walt. And I also too, like Pam and I, we um, pretty predominantly only drink French wines and we really mm -hmm. like the 12, 12.5%. 12 um, it's, it's just a nice, um, we just can't do that high alcohol bitey yeah. wines. And I just find that we enjoy it more um, and it's a, a nice quaffing wine. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and from traveling to France and getting exposed to some of the European wines. And I mean, I, I had exposure to that back when I was working for Young's Market Company that we did so many of our, our wine tours that are company related. We, we would do that in Napa County, Sonoma County. So you did become accustomed to California wines when we went overseas you start developing a, an appreciation for the wines over there yeah. and, then, and you start to realize that a lot of them are really good bargain. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm, they are. You can get some great wines. I, we can't do the California wines anymore. They're just too high in alcohol. Um, right. And, and if you're looking at Napa, I don't want to overgeneralize, but have you looked at the price of Napa cabs? Yeah, they're ridiculous. It's crazy. I mean, it's it's kind of like San Francisco real estate, more or less. Right. I, um, I, Walt, I'm sorry, Jill, your timer went off. Okay. okay. And when Walt was talking, I realized I forgot to put the finishing cheese on top of my sandwiches. I hope you guys remember. So I went back and sprinkled a little more cheese on top of my sandwiches. So let's let's see how we're we're doing here. Yeah. So we, are there any questions about the, the uh, cohort right here? Okay, well, I, I, I'm, for those of you who don't have it, I highly recommend it. And uh, sometime when you're looking for a lighter red and uh, something as an alternative to what you, you may be more commonly bringing home in terms of a red or a Cabernet type wine or, or Bordeaux type wine, uh, Great choice, great choice. Thank you, Walt. Thank you. Thank you. So my, because I added the cheese just a bit, a little bit later, I want it to um, get just a little more melty before I pull it out. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, I have, I'll make a little salad for Lori's lunch. So I'm just gonna drizzle my greens with a little bit of the dressing. And put this on the side. I warmed up the rest of the bachamel that uh, I had left. And I'm going to put that a little bit on the bottom of my plate here. That looks nice. Okay, a little bit of the sauce. And I think it's nice too serving this if you warmed your plate before uh, plating the sandwich is kind of a nice touch. So a little smear of our cheese sauce here. I'm gonna have a couple cornichons on the side. And let's check and see how these are looking. Ah, there's one that looks pretty good. I think I'll take the smaller one here, but I would leave the other three in the oven just, just a tiny bit longer. But this is starting to brown a little bit on the top. Jill, can you bring that around to the camera? Yeah. It smells really good. Lori, I'm going to put this back in the oven. So you want to give me like about, I don't know, say four more minutes just so we don't forget. Okay. What 
There you go. See how it's starting to brown around the edges? Oh, that's I would gorgeous. Go for just a little tiny bit more color, but that looks really good. Beautiful. And it smells wonderful. So you have your croque monsieur, your greens with your classic French vinaigrette, and your French lemon tart with a few blueberries on the side, and then a nice glass. Which, sorry, Walt, which wine? Which one is this? The Cahor. The Cahor wine. For your lunch, Lori. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> All right. So, Jill, can you tell us about your Bistro 2 class? Oh, yes, yes. So, if you like this theme, we thought it'd be fun to do another French Bistro class. So, in two weeks, uh, it's going to be a Saturday again from 11 to 1. We're going to do Salad Nissois, which is a really fun salad to do. Um, it, uh, you're, again, you're making a classic vinaigrette. We're using a really nice tuna, imported tuna that we carry here. You'll have potatoes, hard boiled eggs, uh, green beans, olives, and then we're also making creme brulee. And then Walt has uh, picked up two different wines to pair. Uh, our focus will be more the wine pairing with the, the salad de spa. And I have a great little recipe for creme brulee that um, I want to share with you. And I'll give you some variations on that recipe uh, as well. So I uh, would love to, to have you join us. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And you can just go to our website at sac.coop sac.coop. Uh, we have some really fun March classes. Those are all posted and you can register online. And I'm working on classes for April. We have super fun classes coming up in April as well. Jill will be doing um, a couple more classes in April and we're hoping to have those on our website in a couple weeks. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Any questions, anybody? Great job. And thank you so much. We appreciate you. Bye, Gordon. It was great to see you, Eric. Gordon and Eric. Bye, Patty. I think. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. That was you. It's great. Right. All right. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, Julia. <laughs> I love seeing them. Bye, bye. Yeah. Okay, good job. All righty. Go ahead and end.